The French president meets leaders from the EU's eastern border. As Paris prepares to assume EU council leadership, is Emmanuel Macron looking to take a tougher stance on immigration and take the bloc's leading role from Germany? I'm Andrea Sanke, and today's newsmaker is Macron's visit to the Visegrad Group. Just three weeks before France takes the reins of the EU Council presidency, French President Emmanuel Macron is meeting with leaders of the Visegrad Four in the Hungarian capital. Relations between the EU and the V4 have been strained for years, including over disagreements in migration policy. And in recent months, Warsaw in particular has been at odds with Brussels, with the Polish government claiming EU treaties are incompatible with Poland's constitution. Macron's visit is seen by some as a gesture of reconciliation, but also a chance for France to assume a visible role as the leader of Europe. Now, the Visegrad Group is an alliance of four Central European countries, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. All are members of the EU and NATO. The alliance says it exists to strengthen stability and work for the common interest of Central European states. All V4 countries were granted EU membership in 2004, but at the height of the refugee crisis in 2015, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Slovakia rejected the EU's relocation quota system, causing tension between Brussels and the V4. They were supported by Poland's right-wing government, which came to power in 2015, and rejected compulsory quotas as unfair. Well, finding a common framework on refugees will no doubt be a key priority in Macron's efforts to lead the EU. This visit to Budapest is seen as an opportunity for him to potentially reshape Europe's migration policy in an EU without Angela Merkel. Some predict Macron could use the European presidency as a political tool in his bid for re-election in France's presidential vote in April. Although he hasn't officially declared his candidacy, the effort seems well underway. Macron has outlined a vision of a more assertive France, which seems to appeal to voters on the right. In a recent press conference, he highlighted his determination to forge European sovereignty and strengthen the bloc's borders. We wish to bring forward an emergency support mechanism at the borders in times of crisis, when a member state suddenly has to face a crisis that requires it to strengthen checks at the external borders of our union, as we have once again experienced recently, it has to be able to count on the backing of Frontex, a common agency in charge of it, but also on solidarity reinforcements of member states in terms of police officers as well as equipment. And Macron was referring to the latest crisis at the Poland-Belarus border, which erupted in recent weeks. Poland is refusing to take in thousands of would-be asylum seekers trapped between the two countries as the EU accuses Belarus of pushing people toward the border. But Poland isn't the only EU member state accused of actively working to keep migrants out. Police in Croatia and Greece, too, are accused of illegally pushing back refugees at their borders. EU Commissioner Margarita Skinas says the situation demonstrates the need for an urgent overhaul of EU migration policy. So is Macron the man to lead the way on that policy change? To discuss that and more, I'm joined now from Vienna by Dorit Geva. She's a sociology professor at Hungary's Central European University, and her latest research focuses on nationalism and the far right in Europe. Yasser Luati joins us from Paris, France. He's a human rights and civil liberties activist and co-author of the European Islamophobia Report. And in Warsaw is editor-in-chief at the Visegrad Insight magazine, Wojciech Szabilski. Thanks all so much uh, for being with us. So at the V4 meeting in Budapest, on the brink of France's turn at uh, president of the EU Council, how much is migration and refugee policy on the minds, Yasser, I'll start with you, of the French and of Europeans? And where does Macron really stand as he discusses it with Europe's most anti-immigration leadership? Uh, well, uh, it depends what kind of French you would be asking. If you ask the average French uh, 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 
inhabitant, it would be economics, unemployment, the COVID-19, job insecurity, and, and re re retirement, etc. If you ask the media, of course, it is immigration and what's happening right now at the Polish border. As for Emmanuel Macron, we have to keep in mind that his policies are no different from that of Viktor Orban, less the brutal discourse adopted by the Hungary by Hungary's uh, head of uh, government. Emmanuel Macron just passed uh, two laws that actually crack down on civil liberties and civil society that protect, that, that, that shield the police away from further scrutiny. Of course, the anti-separatism law and the year-long discourse on the Islamist separatism threat. And the second law was the, or is, the comprehensive security law that actually protects not only the police, but also attempted to keep journalists from doing their job. And one other point that Emmanuel Macron has in common, on top of this anti-immigrant uh, rant and uh, hysteria, the fact that he's himself prosecuting journalists when they do their job as we speak. Several journalists are being summoned by domestic intelligence for revealing France's role in allowing extrajudicial executions at the, okay. at the uh, request of the Egyptian government. But Yasser, I just want to be clear, for as much of you know, a centrist as Macron is said to be, you believe the migration policy he plans to push will probably match that of, of France's far right. I mean, I really don't get where people, why people still think Emmanuel Macron is a centrist. All of his policies, both economic and social economic, have been right wing, if not far right policies. I mean, like Emmanuel Macron did not shy away from having a minister of interior calling Marine Le Pen, quote unquote, too soft, not on Islamists, on Islam. This is the government we are dealing with. People, I know people want to believe that Emmanuel Macron is still this liberal anti Le Pen president. Okay. He is not. And he's got more in common with Viktor Orban than the average people what might think. Okay, let me ask Doritz. I mean, do you agree? Is uh, Macron actually here finding common ground uh, with like minded leaders in, in the Visegrad Four when it comes to migration policy? Yes, I, I absolutely agree with the previous analysis. I would like to underscore uh, questioning why Emmanuel Macron is treated as a centrist figure. He ran already in his 2017 presidential election campaign on the claim that he was both right and left, but not centrist. It is clear that since 2017, he has only taken an increasingly rightward turn in terms of his anti-immigration rhetoric, and uh, his left or liberal component has to do more with market liberalism. He and Viktor Orban actually match quite nicely at this point uh, in terms of this convergence of having a very strong anti-immigrant uh, and between the lines um, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim uh, rhetoric along with a pro-market liberalism. Okay, very interesting. Wojcic, let me ask you, I mean, why do you think Macron is really at this Visegrad 4 meeting right now? Is it kind of a matter of protocol because he's assuming uh, the EU Council presidency or is there something more to it and the kind of policy he wants to move Europe forward with? Definitely, there is a mitigation of risks associated with uh, opposition to the EU presidency of France. Uh, next half a year will be critical and the voices from Visegrad 4 are important for the EU presidency of France to deliver. So he's uh, using the platform and meeting with the leaders simply to show, to, to, meet, to, uh, to discuss um, with them uh, what he can count on in terms of support in the, in the policies that he wants to pursue during the French presidency. On the other hand, there was just a week ago a meeting in which Marine Le Pen took part. It was not a Visegrad meeting, but it, um, it was a meeting where both Viktor Orban and Jarosław Kaczynski were present. The meeting of the far right, uh, the so-called Warsaw Summit, the, 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 that uh, draw a lot of attention also to his um, counter uh, candidate, uh, Marine Le Pen. So naturally, Macron is also positioning himself as someone who can also speak with an important uh, segment uh, of the European Union bloc, uh, that is the Central European Governments, V4, Visegrad 4. Hmm. Yeah, so let me ask you, I mean, which do you think is more of a priority for Macron? 
at this meeting? Is it more about, you know, pulling ahead of Germany as uh, the EU's leading power or using this meeting to, you know, shore up more domestic support and appeal to more right-wing voters? Actually, uh, both of them, uh, the, a window has opened for Emmanuel Macron. As you mentioned it, uh, Angela Merkel is leaving and now is being replaced by a new chancellor for, for, for him. He's here to occupy the space and try to position himself as, you know, after Merkel, it might be my turn. It won't happen. You know, Germany is still firmly controlling European institutions. But when it comes to domestic policies, he might also use that. The same way Orban will also use Macron's visit for his upcoming elections uh, in April. And Emmanuel Macron, at the same time, is also facing mm -hmm. crucial elections, the presidency uh, in April, followed by the uh, parliamentary elections. So it's also a way for Emmanuel Macron to position himself as, uh, I'm going to give a new turn to the European Union. But he will also, you know, mark my word, he will use his visit uh, to say to public opinion, don't worry, I'm also dealing with the Eastern Bloc of the European Union by keeping the immigration uh, problem at bay. But again, when Emmanuel Macron says, I'm dealing with Orban as a uh, political adversary, but a European uh, a partner, we do wonder what kind of partnership he's talking about. Not a partnership to, to uphold democracy and human rights, but a, a, a partnership for Macron to appear as a, a, a staunch on immigrants, on, on immigration, and capable of building a bridge with people he, he, he would call his political opponents. Uh, Dorit, let me get your perspective on that. I mean, how much is surpassing a post-Merkel Germany in mind right now? And I mean, does Europe in general want to see France take a real lead here? Or are they happy with uh, the new German leader, Olaf Scholz, to maybe fill whatever perceivable void there is? It is unclear. It is certainly a turning point. I think uh, all of Europe is in shock by uh, the absence of Angela Merkel at the head of the European Union, uh, informally, but also as a, as a political force and as a moral force. Uh, I think uh, it is true that Germany is still presumed to be the uh, de facto leader of the European Union, especially the core states. Uh, and uh, Emmanuel Macron is certainly trying to wiggle his way into that place now that it, it is open to question as to whether Germany really will be able to lead uh, beyond the Angela Merkel era. Uh, but we should also see Viktor Orban as being very clear as a, uh, a leader who has the ambition to fortify an alternative vision of Europe. And as he repeatedly has said in recent years, to fortify a vision of Europe as a Europe of nations. Uh, and so Emmanuel Macron coming to Orban uh, at this particular moment, I think should be seen as really a rivalry over the soul of the European Union project and also its leadership, because Orban has consolidated a solid basis of leadership among like-minded states that are increasingly using this language of Europe as being a Europe of nations. Um, right. as, opposed, as opposed to the previous vision of it. Interesting. You know, Wojciech, it seems to be that there's some paradox here because France and Macron kind of stand for EU unity. They were very much on the anti-Brexit uh, campaign, for example. But now we're talking about how he sits with like-minded leaders uh, at the V4 who have all said they want to be less constrained by the rules of Europe. I mean, are th is there a sense of negotiation then going forward or concessions um, that could be made between these leaders here wanting two different visions of Europe? I mean, is there room for concessions or are EU rules just EU rules? EU rules are rules. Uh, that is uh, no question about it. Let me clarify also that there is no Visegrad group position uh, undermining rule of law that is Viktor Orban individually, and to some extent also Poland, undermining that rule, rule of law. So they are not representing Visegrad group. To the Visegrad group, you have to count in also the Czech Republic and Slovakia that are uh, clearly on the opposite sides. And within the grouping, they are in dispute over this issue with uh, the other counterparts. So there is uh, there is no Visegrad problem with the rule of law. There is a particular Viktor Orban and Jaroslav Kaczynski 
problem of the uh, rule of law. Importantly, uh, the V4 for France, as for any other country, uh, but especially for Germany, is uh, a place on, on the map, um, but also uh, a political force within the EU that Germany and France need to reason with, especially after Brexit. This um, is because partly because of the number of votes in the in votings of the European Council, but also because of the economic importance of the exchange between Germany and Central Europe, and also between uh, France and Visegrad. That is by far uh, the largest uh, on the continent, uh, even surpassing what many in France believe is the main, uh, major one, uh, the exchange between France and China. V4 simply matters for the future of uh, the EU, like many other groupings, um, but this one in particular has some strong cards. Okay, but then how do you reconcile uh, Poland and, and Hungary? I mean, we have to remember Poland is actually being fined 1 million euros per day uh, for violating EU rules on judicial reform, and they don't seem to be looking to take any of it back. Um, how, how, does, how is Macron going to manage, and I characterize it as a paradox, in speaking to the V4 as a group, if half and the more powerful half um, stands where it stands? Well, the, this is uh, election time not only for France. This is election time in Budapest, and there is an election time coming up, uh, the latest by spring 2023 in Poland. Both governments in Poland and in Hungary are actually in decline in terms of popularity, in terms of their chances of being re-elected. The meeting, therefore, is not reinforcing their position, or this is not. Uh, there is no need to reconcile with uh, the V4. V4, uh, the Visegrad group, stands here for the cooperation for the uh, inclusive uh, Europe. In, in terms of uh, also the growth, the prospects, uh, uh, the open borders, um, many of the topics that were uh, else, uh, that were earlier upheld by the British um, uh, membership in the European Union. So I don't think there is a necessity of of uh, of, of um, you know coming into terms with the rule of law or uh, democratic backsliding by talking to V4. In fact, I believe that uh, what you what you have during those meetings is uh, and to, what is it to be expected is that Macron will actually underscore what uh, he and other European partners have been underscoring before. Yeah. The rule of law is uh, pivotal to the future of EU, no matter which direction it goes. Okay. Uh, Yasser, you know, some were actually calling for delaying uh, the French presidency uh, of the EU Council here because of the April election. It's just too complicated to hold a six-month rotating uh, leadership role when Macron is campaigning as he is. D would you agree that it could have been wise or maybe would still be to uh, delay the presidency? It's, I'm sure it's too late now since January 1st it begins. I mean, definitely uh, the fact that we have uh, uh, France uh, presiding the EU while its own president is going to run for re-election and in our analysis that you know Emmanuel Macron will do anything to get re-elected, he has already created a tremendous chaos in order for him to stand as the only viable option. Yes, this raises a question over how will Emmanuel Macron manage to be an impartial EU uh, heading the, uh, the EU while at the same time trying to score political points in domestic uh, policies. But at the same time, something we tend to kind of, you know, not forget, but, you know, not pay attention to is that Emmanuel Macron has waged a foreign policy based on the, on the uh, huge contracts uh, for the arms manufacturers, the nuclear, the nuclear lobby, etc. So we are not, you know, protected from Emmanuel Macron undermining so-called EU values in, in, in order to benefit France's arms dealers and the nuclear uh, sector. He just came back for, from a shameful trip that has re rehabilitated. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman in uh, Saudi Arabia. I don't expect him to protect the EU values uh, during this presidency, but what I fear is that uh, Orban and the likes will tend to make Macron believe that there might be some contracts on the way, the same way he did with the Russians and China. And in return, Emmanuel Macron will kind of stand as a buffer between uh, Orban and EU sanctions. Hmm. Uh, Dorit, um, if, if you want to pick up on that, go ahead. But I actually wanted to go uh, back 
if possible, to what to what Vojtic, uh was was we were talking about with trying to have Poland and Hungary in particular forced into following uh, the EU rules because, as we said, fines don't seem to be working. But that seems to be the only approach at present right now, and that the EU can play this financial card uh, with the V4. How much is EU monetary support really essential um, to the success of the Visegrad countries so that the EU can manage those who want to step outside the framework and the rules of the EU? European monetary support is absolutely crucial to the Orban regime. It's been crucial as a source of public contracting uh, which the Orban regime has very sec successfully used as a means of also uh, fostering political loyalties. I mean, the, these are exactly the type of processes that have resulted in questions about rule of law and misappropriation of European funds. The European, the Hungarian public, it's also important to remember, uh, is very pro EU. There is no appetite uh, for Hungarians to exit the European Union. It is the same in Poland. The public wishes to be part of the European Union. It would any political leader uh, would knows very well that they would pay a huge political cost, a huge political price if they force the country into a situation of being forced out of the EU. Having said that, though, Hungary is a model of a country that has also figured out how to find other ways of financial uh, resources that are outside of the European Union, particularly through building relationships with China, uh, the Belt and Road Project, uh, systems of loans, uh, and also Russia. Um, back to the topic of nuclear energy, for example, uh, in being um, what could be European supported projects for green energy. Instead, uh, Hungary has actually turned to Russia uh, to increase uh, nuclear energy uh, support, uh, infrastructure within Hungary. So on the one hand, so they're really, it's really a, a dangerous game uh, that Orban has managed to balance so far between multiple global powers. On the one hand, reliance on Europe, but um, all these issues with rule of law and corruption, and at the very same time, increasing dependency, actually, not just turning to other countries, to other global powers, but also increasing financial dependency and therefore political vulnerabilities. Uh, that are really dependent on much more powerful figures uh, in the forms of uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Vladimir Putin. Interesting. I, I think it looks like you all agree if I can see you nodding. And we, we just have a few minutes. No, no, wrong. Okay, let me, uh, Vojic, uh, go ahead. Your final thoughts. We have about two minutes left. So very quickly, there is, a, there is a big show off on behalf of Viktor Orban about how much he can balance out, uh, you know, EU funds and membership with this other Chinese and Russian money. I don't think I necessarily disagree with what uh, Dora just uh, said in a moment before, but I want to underline that by any uh, measurement, there is no matching for the EU fund and engagement also in trade relationship mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, we shouldn't buy the song of Mr. Viktor Orban that he can balance out uh, this um, uh, investment money uh, by any sorts of dealing with Russia and China. And then there is a good thing to, to think about why any contract that he has been signing with Russia and China has been made a state secret, most likely knowing also the state of engagement and sort of uh, money that are engaged from Russian or Chinese funds, because that would be plain, uh, plain and obvious um, that uh, there is no competition here. Uh, Vojtic, we actually have a minute left, so I'm going to finish with this question, because, uh, you know, it seems like I'm taking a big step back, but I want to really ask you about the relevance of the Visegrad 4 today. I mean, we know its relevance starting in 1991, uh, and what it, the purpose it served. But looking at today, some argue it actually gives di disproportionately boosters the influence of leaders like Morawiecki and Orban. Uh, do you think it's still a necessary organization? Yeah, it is a necessary organization, like many other groupings within the EU. Uh, however, the politicization, the, the, the abuse of political communication ideology in it uh, is huge and needs to be uh, scaled down in, for, in order for this group to survive. Okay, Wojciech Szybilski, Dorit Geva, 
and Yasser Luati. I'd like to thank all three of you so much for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers and to our viewers as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at the underscore newsmakers and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.